Bruchim Aboim. Last week when we met, we were discussing uh, why be religious and uh, what's in it for me. This connection we have with our Creator. Um, again, what's in it for what's in it for us? You know, they tell a story of a uh, of a thief who was caught in the middle of the act, and uh, when he was arrested by the police, he was afraid that they would uh, start to beat him, beat him up. And what he said to them as they were approaching him, I want you to know that I am a friend of the king. And this kind of caught them by surprise. So they put him in a cell, but they were very careful with him because they weren't sure exactly what the story was. And the next day when they, uh, they had told that he was a friend of the king, they took him to see the king. And when the king saw him, the king looked at the man very carefully and said, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, they say that we know each other. I've never seen you before. And the person looked at the king and said, I apologize, your highness. But you have to understand, I, I was afraid that the policeman would beat me up. And I told him that I was a friend of yours to protect myself. And when the king heard this, he was amused. And he enjoyed the fact that the person felt that he would, his just being his friend would be protection. And because of this, he saved the man. And the man was not prosecuted. Our relationship with God is much the same. And when we acknowledge God, and we say that God is our friend, and we build this relationship, then we actually have someone to turn to. The servant of a king is a king. Why do a mitzvah at all? What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is really a connection. Uh, think for a moment. Um, whether you like Obama or not, but he's the president. But the truth is you're a citizen, he's the president, and you have nothing to do with each other. What would happen if the president was speaking, had a speaking engagement, and uh, he needed his tuxedo, and you got a call from one of the president's aides saying, would you please pick up the president's tuxedo and bring it to the hall where he's speaking? And he would give it directly to the president. Well, it's interesting. Even though you have nothing to do with each other, if you picked up that tuxedo and gave it to the president, you, he would now exist in your mind and you would exist in his. And that would form a relationship. And that's a mitzvah, a connection. And with each mitzvah that you do, the connection gets stronger. And then, as we all do, like a bank account, when we have troubles, that's when we really draw on it. That's when a person really needs. There's no atheist in the foxhole. You know, in my family, whenever anyone has a problem, they always come to me to pray to God. Um, they figure I have an in. I remember being on a plane that was taken back to the gate. And uh, when we got re re reboarded, a cousin of mine was there. And she looked at me as I was passing her seat, and she said, the only reason I got back on is because you're on this plane. I know God loves you. But the truth of the matter is, what a, what a sad case that most people don't have this relationship with God, and they don't feel it. What people say is, I have God in my heart. And imagine, if you would, that you know someone who is a father and has a wife, and he tells to you, that, you know, I really have my family, my wife and children in my heart. I love them dearly. I never see them. I don't have a relationship with them. I don't support them. I really have nothing to do with them. But in my heart, I want you to know that I love them. You would think he's an idiot. But yet people very romantically say that I have God in my heart. And we think this is a, a, a certain level. The truth is that if you don't connect to God with action, then this becomes a problem because you really have no relationship with God. It's really a mirage that the, the Yetzirah, the, the side of evil, gets a person into. The famous book of Tanya is based on the verse that says that the that this thing is very close to you. Beficha, a pasuk in Torah, a verse in Torah, beficha in your, heart, in your mouth, bilvavka in your heart, la so so to do it. So the truth of the matter is, and as we also say in the Shema, the Avos Hashem Lokechem, and to love the Lord your God, Ula Avdo, and to serve Him. That the whole relationship that we have with God has to be based on service. 
But what the side of evil does for us, after all, we're basically decent people. So every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on the New Year's, the Day of Atonement, very few people can go through the days of, El, of, of thoughts of repentance without talking about being better, without thinking about being better. The only problem is every year we go through the same thoughts and the same conversation. Do we connect at the action? The answer is no, and if we do, it's temporary. It's interesting, health clubs, 10,000 members, 300 lockers. How does that come out? Because people don't go, but they do have a card in their pocket so that says they're allowed to go, so that makes them feel healthier. And some of them actually, New Year's resolution, try to get a, a, a machine on, on the 1st of January. It's very difficult. The place is crowded. By the middle of the month, it's no problem. And in February, you can come anytime you want. There's plenty of room because people start off with this New Year's resolution. And that's what the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, gets us to do. In order for us to be with God, we need to have a relationship. Now, it's interesting because there's a verse in Torah that says a man has created ra min arav, evil from birth. Well, if God wants us to be good, why, cre why create us evil from birth? We have a belief in Judaism that when a person, man, a boy, turns 13, a girl 12, that that's when you're given your good inclination. Up until that time, you're really moving around with an evil inclination. But... Why do that? If God wants us to be good, why not give us this good inclination, this nerd, that we're going to live with until we're 13? We get used to being good. And then when this wild and woolly guy who wants to party and do all these wild things comes at 13, we're going to, you know, maybe we're not going to be in a big hurry to have anything to do with him because we've already got set in being good. The Catholic Church says, give me your children to the age of four, and they'll be devout Catholics the rest of their life. You know, once you get used to doing something. So why is it that God creates us Ram and Arav, evil from birth? And the answer is very simply, God wants to be relevant. He wants you in his life. He, if you thought you don't need God, then you're not going to turn to him. Rich people, for the most part, don't need God. They just want God to stay out of the way. Things are good. You know, when you live in Russia, in the early days of the Cossacks, and you have a Cossack at your door ready to break it down and kill you. You know, God and the Messiah and all of these things, you're praying pretty heavy. But when you've got a nice-sized house and a Mercedes in the driveway and money in your bank account and your kids are doing well, healthy, you don't have no time for God. I mean, you know, I'm glad he's around and, you know, everybody else should take care of it. That's part of it. But I really don't need it. Things are good. And that's not what it's about. So when God orchestrates a scenario in life that we call siyata deshmaya, you need the help of heaven. That when you have God with you as a partner, as someone you can turn to, a strength that you can lean on, then life gets simpler. And the truth of the matter is, it takes all fear away from life. There's so many people that live with fear. And fear is really a mirage. Fear, for the most part, many times doesn't even exist. It's the fear of everything that could happen. It's like being OCD. And when you believe in God, the only thing that you, can, you should fear in life is God. And you'd never need to fear God. Because God is a parent. This whole world is a reflection of the world above. That's what we believe. That everything in this world is really a reflection of what's above us. Now, scientists will tell you different reasons. But we believe that if you look at the sky, it's blue. If you look at the ocean, it's blue. But if you look at air, it's really clear. And if you put water in from the ocean in a glass, it's really clear. So where's the blue? And we believe that on the throne of heaven, what we call the Kisei HaKavod, that there is a sapphire brick at the, at the bottom of it. And that blue of that sapphire is reflected onto the sky, which is reflected onto the ocean. And that's why it's blue. Because everything in this world is a reflection of the world above. And just like we love our children, we love our children before they're born. We love our children before we know what they're going to be. We're changing diapers and somehow we're happy about this. And not only that, we're totally negated. If you want to know what true negation is, watch a mother with a child. Her only concern is for that child. Not just in humans, but even in nature. A smaller animal will stand up to a bigger animal and fight for its young. 
All of this is a reflection of the feelings that God has for us. God is not, has not created this world to hurt us, just the opposite, to make us the best that we can be. But why? The truth of the matter is, and it's for another lecture, as to what heaven is and whether there is a hell. But when God creates us, what he does is he gives us a chance to earn what we call heaven. After all, God can give it to us. But why would someone want to get charity if you can earn it? Imagine if you had a father who owned a great factory, and you worked in that factory. And as your father's being led from one department to the other, the CEO who's taking around is describing everyone's job and what they make and what their position is. And then he gets to the department where you're working, and the CEO says, well, he's your son. He really does nothing. He just gets paid because he's your son, and that's it. Quite embarrassing. But what if the CEO says, I want you to know, this is your son. He's worked himself up to this position. And he, makes, he earns every penny that he makes. And I wish all the employees here worked like he did. What a sense of joy for the father, and what a sense of joy for the son. And that's what our relationship with God is. He gives us the opportunity to earn our place in, in what we call eternity. And this becomes the essence of what it is. Now, the proof of this is the desert experience that the Jews had when they left Egypt. That when the Jews were taken out of Egypt, if you look in the Bible, you'll see that there were times when God killed people when they made the golden calf. Some, some 3,000 men were killed. And there were other times that it says people sinned and they were killed. And really from that we learn the basis of actions and consequences, which we really don't see today. I mean, we sin all the time, nothing happens. It's not like a hand reaches out from heaven and punishes us. And if we do see punishment, it's something that's indirect that we have to connect to. But it's not obvious. In the desert it was. But how is that a benevolent God? How is that a father? And the answer is that all the Jews needed to leave Egypt with is 600,000 men. The Torah tells us there were 603,550. So I would think that those 3,550 were the walking dead, those that should have died in Egypt during the days of darkness. And the proof is that 3,000 men were killed for making the golden calf. Meanwhile, what we know, that was a momentary lapse. You had the tribe of Don, Dan, that were served the, the idol of Micha in Egypt. During the ten plagues they, had, they served it. They took this pestle Micha, this idol of Micha, with them when they left Egypt. They took it when they crossed the Red Sea. They had it at Mount Sinai when they received the Torah. They had it in the desert when they traveled for the 40 years. And if you go into the prophets, you'll find they still had it. And yet, when Amalek came to, to kill the Jews in the desert, really, they were surrounded by the clouds of glory. No one could get in. They had a protective shield around them. Yet Amalek were able to kill Jews. How could they do that? And the answer was that the tribe of Dun, those that served the idol, was not allowed to enter the, the, the camp because the clouds surrounded wouldn't let them in. So when Amalek came, they killed those that served idols. And instead of God saying, well, good, you took my garbage off the street. What Moses did, what Moshe did, is he took a thousand righteous people from each of the tribes to war with Amalek and kill them for these idol worshippers. And that was not a momentary lapse. That was something they did every day on purpose. So what we see is that God does not want to kill his children. He does not want to kill the sinner. What he wants to do is eradicate the sin. And what we need to do is connect with God in action. And if we can do that, we form a relationship with God Almighty that we can draw on just like a big bank account that's always there, ready for us in times of need. And we need to do it when we don't need Him so that we are able to serve Him. God bless and have a good Shabbos.